Good, good morning, everyone. We're, we're, uh, we're ready to go now. We've sorted out our, our, our laser pointer issues. It's a bright screen, and we needed a brighter laser pointer. Um, thank you very much, all of you, uh, for coming out. Welcome to the opening technical session of the conference we've all been waiting 10 years for. My name is John McGaughy. I'm uh, president of Mirror Geoscience, one of the sponsors of, of the meeting and with my colleague, Cheryl Baudry, the co-technical chair of, of Exploration 17. Exploration 17 is an important event, and this is an important session, the plenary state of the art in mineral exploration technology. We have a stellar list of invited speakers this morning, known for the breadth of experience in specific mineral exploration domains. Dennis Woods will be speaking on ground and borehole geophysics, Greg Hodges on airborne geophysics, Paul Agnew on geochemistry, then we'll have a coffee break, following which Dave Coulter on remote sensing and spectral geology, Colin Farquharson on modeling and inversion, and Cam McQuaig on exploration targeting. Each of these speakers has been invited to give their perspective on what's happened in mineral exploration technology in the past decade, and to put a stake in the ground, so to speak, marking where we are today. And lastly, to implicitly or explicitly suggest a perspective on what the trends may say about the decade ahead. And with that, we'll, we'll begin. Uh, our first speaker this morning is Dennis Woods. Dennis is uh, part owner, president, and chief geophysicist of Discovery International Geophysics, a full-service geophysical contractor and consultancy specializing in electromagnetics, induced polariz polarization, and resistivity. The company is focused on innovative techniques and scientific research to improve the application of geophysics to the discovery of new mineral resources. Dennis has had a long career in mineral exploration geophysics, including assistant professor of applied geophysics at the Department of Geological Sciences. It doesn't say it here in the bio, but he was also a supervisor of my master's thesis way back in the 1980s at Queen's University. He was head geophysicist of Granges Incorporated, later Vista Gold Corporation in the 1990s. He's been a ge geophysical consultant through most of his career and has founded a variety of geophysical contracting companies in Canada, the US, and China. Dennis graduated in geological engineering from Queen's University at Kingston in 1973, and then went on to earn a master's in engineering geophysics at Queen's in 1975 by carrying out a scale model study of the Crone borehole PEM system. He then spent almost four years in Canberra, Canberra, Australia, completing a PhD degree in solid earth geophysics before returning to Kingston in 1979 to begin an academic career at Queen's. This lasted until 1987 when he headed out west to BC and started his career in the mineral exploration industry with a variety of positions in different geophysical con contracting and mineral exploration companies while also working on his own and eventually in partnership with Brent Robertson in Discovery Geophysics, which is now celebrating its 20th year in business. So with that, I'll ask Dennis to come up to the stage and talk to us about ground and borehole geophysics, the past decade, the decade ahead. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, there's uh, four parts to my talk. Uh, <clears throat> the overview of the advances in geophysical technology over the past decade, as John was mentioning. But um, really, a lot of that is covered by uh, Pat Killeen's advances in geophysical technology trends and uh, exploration that's published in the Northern Miner every year. And so I decided not to go over all the different uh, techniques that have been improved, different instruments, different widgets, and so on. Because you can go to these uh, sites, DMEX site, KEGS online, click on resources, and you can download all this stuff and have a look at it. Pat Killeen goes over all the uh, corporate highlights, goes over airborne geophysical techniques, goes over ground survey techniques. I put this uh, particular picture up because it shows my, uh, it shows my partner here, Brent Robertson, carrying out a borehole pulse EM survey in Alaska. My partner for the last 20 years. No, instead, um, I decided to focus on the, uh, the state-of-the-art aspects of this. 
And particularly, I want to go over one thing that, that I particularly am interested in, and that's 3D, geological and geophysical modeling, 3D data acquisition in the surface mode, and particularly IP resistivity, uh, signal to noise improvements that have to go hand in hand with 3D data acquisition, uh, leading to a, a fuller, more encompassing view of uh, mineral exploration properties in a 3D world. Now, I, uh, I should back up here and state that I am no expert in any of these three different categories. I just simply uh, team up with uh, people that are a lot smarter than me who do these sort of things. Uh, and uh, thankfully, I got a lot of information and slides from uh, various people to put this uh, presentation together. But what I did do is I Googled 3D geological models, and an awful lot come up uh, on, the, on the internet. Uh, everybody who gives presentations likes to show their, their, their final 3D model. They all look very pretty, and you tend to you find them on the uh, internet quite easily. There's everything in here from uh, mining scale uh, right up to mining scale. Oops. Interesting that this thing uh, advances uh, at the same time as points, but at any rate, we'll get past that. It, uh, it shows the, uh, everything from mining scale up into regional scale uh, type of models uh, in, both, uh, in both mineral exploration and seismics. So there's a lot of people doing a lot of 3D geological modeling. What I'm going to do is give you a, a, an example of this with, um, that was kindly uh, given to me by Tim Chalk, excuse me, Tim Chalk at uh, Muir Geoscience Brisbane, uh, a study with the Geologic Survey of, of Queensland. It's the Mount Dore IOCG belt in Queensland. It's a large regional study in western Queensland, uh, a 175 by 70 kilometer area. It started with a 3D geological geophysical modeling exercise and then finished with a, a detailed 3D pros prospectivity analysis. I won't get into any of the prospectivity analysis. I'm just going to uh, touch on the uh, 3D geological modeling, geophysical modeling aspects of this as an example of of uh, what's done. We start with a geological model and digitize in the, uh, all the various contacts and fault planes uh, in the surface model. Uh, fortunately, this area is, uh, and probably picked for that reason, because it's uh, got a lot of public domain data. There's a lot of uh, industry data as well. Uh, and it has a very high uh, mineral prospectivity. Uh, the next step after digitizing in the contacts is to uh, use available sections. This area also is, um, has a lot of uh, a seismic and MT sections, a lot of drill sections. So uh, it was put together to form all these um, various sections, these uh, uh, different um, contacts between different units and faults are all digitized in. And then planes are defined uh, on the faults, on the contacts, in 3D space. This is all using the GOCAD SCUA modeling program by Muir Geoscience. And then the, the voxel between planes is filled in with um, uh, lithologies. It's all, each one is identified as a, as a different lithology. And that's the uh, geological model construction in the, in the final geological model. However, there was a, let's back up a second. There's some granites here, and that's going to advance it, and so I have to retreat it. Uh, there's, oh boy. <laughs> I give up. There's, uh, some, there's some granites in that, uh, in that picture, and um, uh, it's, they, there's no sections through them. There's not as many sections through the granite. So it's unknown exactly how deep these granites go. Uh, and, you know, of course, granites are never drilled. So uh, in order to improve the modeling, uh, the geologic model, a, the first step 
was to use a, um, uh, the gravity data that was collected over the area to do a 3D inversion of the gravity data to try to pin down the bottom of the, the granites. Uh, the, uh, the panel on the, uh, on the left is um, before and the inversions, uh, before the bottom of the granites was brought up uh, by the inversions. And the panel on the right is uh, the final. And you can see it's brought it up in some cases up uh, a kilometer or more. So that fixed up the geological model quite a bit. So this is an overview of all the geophysical data that's uh, going to be applied to this uh, exercise. Um, we've looked at the uh, geological data, the geological map. It's on the bottom section there. Uh, above that is uh, uh, TMI magnetics. Above that is a gravity that's already been used, but it's going to be used in an inversion again. And then finally, there's a, um, well, not finally, but uh, in addition, there's a geotim data set uh, of um, conductivity um, near surface. Uh, at depth, we have seismic sections, what I mentioned before, and some um, MT sections. So this is the workflow that's used. Uh, you form the geological model based on your best information of uh, geology and, and geologic sections. Uh, you do the 3D inversions of the data with it uh, constrained by this model where, it's, uh, where things are known. And you get, uh, in the magnetic case, after doing a 3D inversion, you get a susceptibility model, gravity, you get a density model, and out of the G, uh, geotem, you get a conductivity model. And all three of these are put together to define uh, physical properties of various lithologies, and so the lithologies can be uh, identified in the final uh, geologic model. The next uh, thing I want to go through is 3D geophysical data acquisition. Of course, all we've been looking at uh, so far has been uh, basically 3D by default. It's potential field data, and you can invert that to get a 3D. Shall we test it? Works. Uh, <clears throat> but of course, in, uh, in uh, controlled source techniques, IP and EM, uh, it's a much more complex story. Uh, you've got transmitters and receivers. In order to get full 3D coverage, uh, you need a, a very clever arrangement of transmitters and receivers uh, multiplied by N in order to get uh, full 3D coverage. So I'm going to just review this briefly uh, on IP resistivity. Sorry. I'm going to start with the basics in IP resistivity. This is a slide right out of my uh, teaching days at Queen's. It shows the basic uh, arrays that everybody's used to. Uh, spreading arrays uh, uh, on the left and on the right, these, um, uh, the arrays I'm going to be talking about, pole-pole, pole-dipole, won't be talking about dipole dipole, but the, the two uh, the main ones we'll be talking about is pole pole and pole dipole, particularly. Uh, this is just a little aside. Uh, a few years ago, I was faced with a problem of um, having to record pole pole data with a multi channel receiver that didn't have a pole pole setting, it only had pole dipole. So I had to figure out a way to collect pole pole data out of a whole series of pole dipole readings. And the solution was, so here's a pole-dipole type of a reading. Here's the current pole. Here's all the dipoles. This would be a receiver here reading all these various dipole readings. Uh, that's the receiver I had. What I really wanted was to get the voltage at each pole reading relative to an infinite. So it's a pole-pole reading. So to get that, I simply took a pole-pole reading of one electrode and all the rest are dipole readings, so I just summed them. Some summation of voltages through Ohm's law and got the voltage at every one of these uh, poles. Uh, called the technique indirect pole-pole measurement. And I bring this up here because it's gonna, I'm going to be coming back to it uh, a little bit when we're uh, talking about 3D systems. The first attempts at 3D were the common offset uh, pole dipole rays that uh, came out of Australia in uh, 
in the early 90s. And uh, this consisted of, looking at the right panel here, uh, a single receiver, uh, or two receivers, uh, reading uh, uh, eight channels, eight, uh, eight channels each, so 16 dipoles, read on a line, and then the current injected uh, off the side of it, hence the name offset pole dipole. And of course, if you build this up a little bit, you put your receivers, uh, 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 if you have more um, uh, receivers, you can put more electrodes out, record more dipoles, and have more current, so you get more information across line as well as along the line. But you don't get much because there's a limit to how many receivers you can have and how much you can have on the ground at one time. This was followed by uh, the development of distributed array pole dipole surveys. Uh, started with, uh, this is in the, in the mid to late 90s with uh, MIMDAS and, uh, and then Titan 24. Uh, this is the Titan 24, whoops. They look the same, so it's hard to keep them straight. Uh, the Titan 24 consists of two channel receivers now, but a lot of them, 24 of these two channel uh, receivers, all connected together by LAN cable, so that you can record from everything simultaneously from one site. And each, uh, each receiver is connected to two, two uh, dipoles, an orthogonal dipole and an along-the-line dipole. So we're now getting a little bit of 3D information, uh, depending on how many lines you got laid out. But this is primarily, a, again, a 2D type of survey. But it does allow you to collect data both in a forward and a reverse direction as you inject current between the electrodes here, and sometimes offline as well. Uh, as you inject current, you get information going this way and that way. So it, it doubles the amount of information you're getting. So that's the distributed array type of approach. Uh, this is an interesting uh, adaptation of that uh, from Vancouver, uh, from SJ Geophysics. It's um, uh, a four channel uh, system now. Each one of these receivers, the blue boxes here, are four channel receivers. So we're recording uh, four dipoles. But instead of cross, uh, uh, measuring the orthogonal and inline dipoles, he measures these uh, diamond-shaped dipoles. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, you don't get into a null coupling to, or an, a null uh, voltage um, potential uh, uh, situation. Uh, same idea, though. Inject current between this lineup of receivers um, and... Um, and get some cross-line information out of that. We now come to the full 3D array systems. And this started with the Orion system from Quantec in uh, 2010. So this is after the last uh, Exploration 07 meeting. Uh, here we have now a six-channel receiver measuring six dipoles and both along the line and cross line, but of course now line and cross line doesn't have any meaning because it's the, it's the same amount. And if you, if you expand that into a full setup, uh, you can see that we now have a completely orthogonal arrangement of, of dipoles. You still inject current in between, uh, or even in the middle of these, you inject current. So, and, but all of these are, are, uh, all of these are uh, connected together through LAN cables, and you can record all of these dipoles up to about 300 at one in, it, uh, with each current injection. Uh, so you get a tremendous amount of data. Uh, here's a, an example, uh, just looking at some detail. Uh, a current injection here. Uh, here's a dipole over here, so we're reading that dipole from that current injection. That's uh, effectively the, uh, the conceptual current path or array path. And uh, you can see if you add it all up, and there's a lot more than this, uh, look at all the different um, type of geometries you get from every single current. If you, um, if you display this, uh, these lines as a dot rather than a line, a dot plotted at a depth equal a little bit of trouble here.
um, the, the depth of the dot is a function of how far apart the dipole is from the current injection. And you get this thing, we call them cloud plots of all these dots. So every single green dot here is representative of another reading from a combination of a dipole and a current injection from an, a complete array over the area you're looking at. So we're now looking at true 3D. We now jump ahead to 2016, last year, uh, and the development of the DS32 system. This system is conceptually somewhat different from the previous ones in that there's only a single receiver with uh, each electrode, each pole electrode. There's the receivers, there's a receiver there, there's a whole bunch of them, and each receiver is on each electrode. And the other side of the uh, input voltage is connected to a common voltage reference. So now we're re recording the potential at each one of these electrodes in reference to this wire that covers the entire area, one common reference. So to get the dipole readings, you just simply start subtracting a pole reading. So this is the inverse of what I was showing earlier about uh, an indirect type of approach. And you can get any kind of dipole you want here, in any direction you want, in any spacing you want. It's completely wide open. These next series of slides from, uh, from Jonathan Rudd at DS uh, show um, uh, a graphical display of the differences between 2D and 3D uh, resistivity, IP resistivity. The, we're going to show this by um, rows diagram. So current is injected here and current goes out in every direction, looking down, looking in section, current's going down into the ground, laterally outward. For a conventional 2D IP, which was done from the 60s right through to the mid 90s, uh, of course we've got current and we're just looking in one direction, a conventional 2D type of setup. For distributed array 2D, this is a rose diagram, so we're looking at information uh, in this rose diagram. The only information you're getting from that current injection is up the line and down the line. It's a distributed array 2D. There is very little cross-line information. The full 3D, which I just got finished showing, has a full um, uh, information coming from all angles and all depths. Uh, there is, it is possible to uh, uh, construct arrays that are biased in one direction uh, for economic reasons, uh, for um, logistical reasons, and you might end up with something that's a partial 3D. So it's dominantly um, uh, lots of information along lines, but not as much across lines. So let's look at some of these previous arrays, the offset uh, pole dipole array. So remember that had a, uh, a currents um, on each side of a line of potentials. At shallow depth, you are seeing some cross-line information. Sure, you are at shallow depth getting a bit of 3D information, but once you get deeper, uh, you've lost all uh, 3D, and it really, it's a 2D survey. And the really, the same applies to uh, these partial 3D surveys. Uh, there's a little bit more information at uh, well, at shallow depth. If you've got enough of these laid out, you can have. Um, uh, more information cross-line because of this diagonal recording. But again, once you get deep, it's primarily a, a 2D survey. But if you lay out a full network, uh, either the Ryan or the DS system of uh, receivers in green, transmitters in red, uh, we call this a 3D patch, uh, you get 3D, complete 3D information from shallow, medium, and deep. And here's a cloud, this is a cloud, uh, a diagram from a recent survey. There was uh, up to 50,000 data points out of the survey. This is just simply a 700 by 700 meter area, uh, but it shows very good 3D coverage. So just to review the history, we uh, start uh, in the early days. Uh, these are a number of uh, data samples per, uh, per survey. Uh, up until the 2D distributed array, we were only doing about 100 or so uh, uh, samples. Once we got into 2D distributed array, it came up to more like 1,000. Uh, the start of the 3D distributed arrays in 2010, 
with the Orion system up into the hundreds of thousands of data points, and now with the DS system, it's getting up into the millions of data points. Uh, signal to noise, I think I'm going to uh, skip over a lot of this. Uh, basically, uh, it's all well and good to It's all well and good to measure all this beautiful 3D data in different directions, but the data has to be good. And a problem with IP data is that it's not good. There's all sorts of noise. This we discovered once we started collecting full waveform data. And what makes this uh, possible to try to do something about it is the fact that we do have complete full waveform data now with all of these uh, more modern systems. Uh, Kim Frankholm sent me these uh, for a uh, uh, geophysics for geologists course we held at the Roundup uh, earlier last year. So there's a whole bunch of different noises here that come in. We didn't, uh, we didn't really know what was going on. All we just saw was bad data and the chargeabilities or the resistivities and you just throw it out. Those are the old days. Now we can actually look at it and, and realize, boy, we got, there's a lot of noise. All sorts of different things. So what do you do about it? Ah, uh, this is the worst of it is the natural telluric noise uh, comes into uh, IP resistivity. It's a signal for MT, of course, but for IP resistivity, it's a noise issue because it comes in the exact same bandwidth as what you're trying to do. Well, the answer is stacking. Now, uh, Glenn prepared all this for me, but sorry, Glenn, I'm gonna just flip over it because I wanna get to the conclusions. It's all about Halver Halverson stacking and uh, how to go about it in smart ways in order to get rid of these um, bad noise effects that you see in, in the signals. And he had a few pearls of wisdom here. And I think the top one is the important one. The fact is that the, we're not looking at VP and VS, apparent resistivity and chargeability. We're looking at the time series. That's what we're looking at now. Just like seismics, they look at the complete time series. Is this, uh, I've got five minutes for questions, right? John? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that gives me just enough time to go through some conclusions here. Now, what I want to show in these conclusions is a comparison to seismic 3D, because I think we can learn a lesson from what our uh, friends in the petroleum industry have been doing over the past 20 years, 30 years. So I'm going to show, uh, I drew up these timelines of developments in 3D seismics. A 3D seismic actually started in 65, uh, was some of the earliest, it's quite a, a long time ago. So just focus your attention on the bottom part of the screen and the, uh, and the bottom scale, time scale on this timeline. So the first cross spreads were actually experimented with way back in the 60s, but you know, it didn't receive much uh, treatment because you know, they were too busy uh, looking at 2D seismics and refining them, getting better uh, uh, common uh, midpoint uh, stacks and uh, migrations and all the millions of things that, uh, that have gone on and the, and the great amount of money that's spent on seismic. Uh, really, 3D uh, didn't really get started until about uh, 78 or so with the first uh, rudimentary 3D surveys. I think the first 3D survey was shot in Canada in 1978. And um, this was followed very quickly by realizing that uh, uh, you could make time slices so you could actually view this 3D seismic data in the third dimension by making time slices. And all sorts of interesting reefs would pop out and all the rest of it. So, but it really wasn't until about seven years later that um, the, uh, the, um, you know, the, the main orthogonal uh, 3D seismic that you see today that got started, and that was about 85. Now since 85, improvements have been made in migration, and also there's certain noises that come in in a 3D a seismic environment. Uh, those are all improved over the years, but by 95, another 10 years later, after the first orthogonal seismic su um, surveys, by 95 it's completely routine. And certainly by 95, it's uh, almost dominating the seismic industry. Certainly another 10 ye years later, by 2005, it's completely taken over, maybe you know, 60, 70, 80% of all seismic is 3D. Now let's compare the developments of 2D, uh, 3D IP resistivity. The first distributed array 2D surveys happened in 98 here, as I mentioned earlier. The first um, introduction of 3D distributed arrays 
with the Ryan system, 2010, and here's the introduction of the, uh, the DS32 3D system using the CR, CR, CVR method that was in 2016. So you notice that there's some similarities here in the gaps between them, or in the timing of these developments. So here we have fully a 3D, complete, complete arbitrary 3D uh, architecture of a IP resistivity survey uh, at, the, at, the, at the equivalent time of um, the orthogonal 3D seismics. So you can see that we got in the future here, we've got to look forward to all this development that's happened in 3D till we reach the point in 2027 20, where we're going to be re re routinely using 3D IP resistivity surveys. That's my prediction, and then, uh, well, if I'm around in 2027, 20, we'll see if it uh, holds true. This is, that graph is important, one more, because this shows what happens when you start applying 3D. Uh, in 90, uh, the early 90s was the start of the 3D revolution. By 95 or so, it, it um, basically had taken over. As, uh, as more and more 3D was being done, you had more and more success. You had uh, an overall success rate of 2D versus 3D from 90 to 96, 14% versus 90%. So that's the percentage success of a drill hole. Gas, the same, and so on. So a much greater increase in success rates, and that's what I predict will happen when we start doing 3D uh, IP resistivity in a routine way. By 2027, we're going to have these kind of success rates. And that's where I will end. Thanks, time for questions. We don't have time for questions. Yeah. 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 Th thanks again, Dennis. Unfortunately, we don't have time uh, uh, for questions, but I invite you to track Dennis down throughout the conference and, and have a conversation with him about his, present, his interesting presentation.